So it's, it's my, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Um, so Dr. Uh, Bartlett Mel is an associate professor of bio biomedical engineering at the University of Southern California. Dr. Mel's research focuses on using computer models to study brain function at a single cell and system levels, as well as the role of active dendritic processing in the sensory and memory related function of pyramidal neurons. Dr. Mel received uh, his Bachelor uh, in Science in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD in Computer Science from University of, of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. So please welcome Dr. Mel to give his, his talk titled Dendrites Lie at the Crux of a Customizable Cortical Computing Architecture. Thank you very much, and thanks to um, Ila and whoever else was responsible for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so this is a picture that takes me back a long way, um, not maybe that far, but when I was in graduate school, I was very inspired by this. It's a, it was Sintaga Tai's kind of conception of what the cortical, what a, what a module of the cortex was, was like, uh, mainly from an anatomical point of view. You know, you have pyramidal neurons and you have lots of different interneuron types, but it was organized in some kind of a structure, he felt, and many people have been interested in over the years in what that structure is, but uh, just identifying that there is some kind of repeating module in the cortex. It, it's a fascinating idea because what's amazing about the cortex is that this, this piece of tissue, I mean, which is basically similar across the cortex, is able to do um, state-of-the-art visual processing, state-of-the-art sound processing, state-of-the-art tactile processing, language processing, motor control, language, did I say that already? Uh, apparently not doing memory very well, um, and emotions and, and so on. And each of those things, the cortex can do better than what we know how to do any of them from a technological point of view. How do you make a piece of biological tissue that, that can do that? Um, one way to ask that question is, what are the parameters of the circuit that you can tailor to make it do so many different things? So how do you, how do you get at this? So we, we thought, have thought that a good place to start is the pyramidal neuron, uh, which is the, the main cell type in the cortex, or the most numerous cell type. And the, and the, the ways that we like to operate or to kind of bounce back and forth between two different kinds of questions. One are, you look at the hardware, such as that neuron, and you ask, what are the hard hardware components able to compute? These are things you could do with biophysical studies and sort of ask what the computing capabilities are, and people have been doing this since, uh, my, you know, since the 1980s. Uh, and uh, you know, I was going to say, my postdoc advisor, Christoph Koch, was one of the earliest people doing this, and Tommy Poggio, and so on. And so you can do this and get some ideas about capabilities, and then you, you need to do this too, which is to study the problem that the neuron is presumably involved in solving. And, and, and the back and forth between them gives you some good leverage. So I'm going to first start with that, and I'm going to start with a summary slide. Uh, this is our current working model of one pyramidal one. Here's a pyramidal neuron, cell body, basal dendrites, um, apical oblique dendrites, tough dendrites, and these are covered with spines and synapses, excitatory synapses mainly, but inhibitory synapses also mainly clustered around the cell body but occurring in the dendrites too. It, it received maybe 10,000 or 20,000 inputs a cell like this. They're coming in over uh, space in the dendritic tree in time, and we need to know what's the input-output rule for this very complicated cell. And so over many years, and um, I should say many people's work, um, We've kind of, this is what we think, and again, it's lots of other people's ideas are built into this, but that you have individual dendritic branches, uh, you know, sort of mainly representing things that are near the sum of these thin dendrites. They individually are separately thresholded nonlinear units whose results combine or can add at the cell body. And then, then the apical tuft is a separate network um, that, that has separately thresholded units again, and then the total there is helping to set the gain for the cell as a whole. So this is probably not a perfect model, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it has some merits. And I think I have, um, oh yeah, and then I wanted to add another thing that I just learned recently from, uh, from people in Mark Harnett's group, and Mark also, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Dimitra and, um, and um, uh, Courtney and so on, that there are other dendrites, th there's also variation in the degree of nonlinearity in the dendrites on, on an individual cell from sort of very nonlinear near the basal dendrites because of a lot of NMDA channels and less nonlinear, in other words, more linear 
um, as moving up into the apical trunk. So you have this interesting variability of the transduction capabilities of individual dendrites. And so that's going to figure also into our thinking. Uh, so you have a, a pretty complicated model cell. Actually, I want, to measure, I want to mention something about this little picture here. So we think, when I said separately thresholded unit, I didn't necessarily mean that a dendrite adds everything up and then applies a, a sigmoidal threshold or something. Um, we found, and this was in collaboration with Jackie Schiller's group, with, there were experiments and there were models that it's best to think about an individual dendrite, at least on a cortical neuron, as having a kind of a multidimensional uh, sigmoidal input output function, which depends on the relative locations of inputs. So you can have inputs on the distal side and the proximal side. And they interact in an asymmetric way. And they create this multidimensional surface there. And I'm going to allude to that later, how that could be quite functionally important. Anyway, that's that. And I, I just want to put, for as a contrast, the Conventional neuron is the point neuron where you have all the excitatory and inhibitory things being added up at the cell body with weights, and then that number is fed to the axon. So this would be the, the neuron inside a conventional neural network. Now, let's go back to, um, let's, let's go to this and look at, look at, start looking at problems that these neurons are presumably involved in solving. So I'm very interested in object recognition. And if I said to you, what is, what is this right here, um, what would you say? Okay, and, and how about this one? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, should I, I should have picked an easier one, okay, big, okay. Anyway, no, but you, you guys did well. Um, so how do you know what something is? Uh, well, you know, as artists know and psychophysicists know, for example, Nancy Kenwisher uh, in here, uh, the key information needed for recognition is contained in line drawings for humans, and you can flash these at yourself uh, 20 a second, and you can process them very easily. Um, so that's, it, and these line drawings are basically containing contour information, um, contour information of the boundaries of the objects, the boundary between the horse and the background, the boundary from the horse's leg and the rest of the horse, and so on. And so boundaries are critical for recognition. So how do you, um, how do you do this? Okay, I'm gonna, well, okay. Okay, when do you see a fire hydrant? <laughs> good, okay, you guys are really good. That's Irv Biederman's thing, I really, I really like that, it's fun. So how do you do boundary detecting? How do you make a boundary detecting neuron of the cortex? So if you wanna answer this question, okay, first thing you notice is orientation tuned simple cells. Now this is, this pic is not Hubel and Weasel's picture, but they already figured out in 1962 that you had cells that, had, that liked, were sensitive to light along a boundary and sensitive to dark on the other side of the boundary, and they were orientation tuned. And that they were, they, since these days, uh, cells, simple cells like this are thought to be the first stage of object boundary protection in the brain because, you know, because they're oriented and they like boundaries, okay? And they're also assumed to be good at it, which is false. So we're going to um, now situate our kind of neuron model in the middle of this cortex, which layer two, three, and here's layer one. It's kind of, you know, anyway, it's an abstraction. And imagine that we're gonna make this, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna impart to our cell a simple cell receptive field by having a driver neuron that has a receptive field and it looks for light, dark contrast, and it's gonna send some excitation onto the dendrites of this cell and therefore give it an orientation tuned response. And also I'm gonna throw in a divisive normalization circuit uh, this cell activates an inhibitory neuron, a parvalbumin neuron, like a basket cell, which sort of sends feed forward um, inhibition. This is basically David Heger's model from 1990. You have sort of feed forward kind of linear filter with giving the orientation tuning and then a feed forward divisive normalization. So if we do that, we're gonna have a cell that responds, you know, to some extent to horizontally oriented boundaries. Okay, now here's where, uh, Oh, in, in, you know, and that's what I'm representing here with that thing. Here's where um, I said that that kind of a, a, a model doesn't re, re, uh, detect boundaries well in natural images. These are not natural images, but I'm, I'm illustrating a point. So if you have a linear filter that likes light up here and dark down there, and you pass that through a divisive normalization, then it, it's gonna like this. Um, that's a good boundary, but it's weak. It's gonna like this just as much, and it's gonna like this just as much. And the problem is that this thing is much more common in natural images, this kind of a structure, than this. So if you tune the threshold to accept this pattern as an input to detect this boundary, then you're gonna get a lot of false positives, which is to say low precision. Um, and that, that you can confirm easily in natural images. So there's that. That's just the correspondence there. 
Um, now, could you do better than that by having, uh, having a whole bunch of, you know, let's say hundreds of cells with different orientations and positions sort of in the vicinity of this reference location where you're interested in the boundary and take all of their responses and do something better with it that would be better for boundary detection. So what we decided to do was study boundary detection. This is completely independent of the brain. Um, these are the two people, Gabriel Mel and Chait Ramachandra, Chandra, who uh, worked on this, and there's a preprint on BioArchive. So here's what we did. We gathered ground truth data on and off object boundaries. So someone shows you this and says, is there a boundary cutting through this reference thing? You say yes, and if it says here, you'd say no. And so we could take thousands of images and sort them into the yeses and nos, and then for each of them, we can collect all these hundreds of filters that are around filter one, filter two, filter three, et cetera, and collect their responses on the yes and no categories. And we did this for about 30,000 natural image patches. Um, and then we applied the Bayes' rule to get some kind of expectation for what one of these precursor cells in the neighborhood should tell to your, the boundary cell um, in to help it detect boundaries better. And there's an assumption here, which I'm not going to talk about today. It's not actually a true assumption, but it nonetheless lets us apply Bayes' rule and see something that will happen. OK, so here is what th we learned from this simple exercise. We said the probability, yes, there's a boundary, given that you could measure all of these cells around you has this kind of mathematical form, which, which has one term per neuron. So here's the cell with this receptive field relative to the reference location, a different one relative to the reference, a different one, and there would be hundreds of these. And what, what we found was that each cell, there were different kinds of things you could have. A cell like this, which is really well aligned with the reference location, can send to the boundary cell and should send as its activity increases along this axis moving to the right, an increasingly excitatory uh, input. So this would be like an excitatory connection from this cell to this cell. Here, since it's kind of an incompatible receptive field, we have predicted from this simple analysis that you should have sort of increasingly negative effect on the boundary cell when this cell's response increases. But then there were other cells, interestingly, that had kind of partially overlapping and partially aligned that had this interesting pattern we predicted that would be non-monotonic, where at first it would sort of excite the boundary cell, but then as its response get higher, it would then sort of become inhibitory. And we realized that all of these, um, this pattern of activation or, or of interaction functions between this cell and the cell or this cell and the cell could be subsumed by one sort of simple model where each of these cells both directly excites and then also indirectly inhibits the boundary cell and the, the sort of uh, the compounding of the excitation and the inhibition would allow you to get all of these different effects. Okay, so we trained, um, we trained a network to learn what actually natural images would tell this circuit to do. Here's a whole bunch of cells for each of these precursor receptive fields. Um, we'd have several variants with different thresholds. And then each of them, so we have hundreds of these cells, each of them has one weight directly onto the boundary cell. That's the excitatory connection you know, between these nearby cells. And then a, an excitatory weight onto these inhibitory neurons, which kind of collects all of this, and then sends one inhibitory number to that cell. This was the network that we modeled. We trained weights using a delta rule, a single layer learning rule, not backprop, and then found these interaction functions. And we found that we do indeed have pure excitatory effects between cells that are well aligned, and we have pure inhibitory effects between cells that are poorly aligned with the reference location. And then we also found these, these non-monotonic interactions, which are quite interesting. And, and, but, but as I said, the whole thing is very, uh, it, it relies on this circuit motif where you have direct excitation and indirect inhibition, which is a very common cortical circuit motif. And just quickly, we found that this also helped boundary detection. So if you wanted to, this is a precision recall curve that says how well you're going to detect boundaries with these different models. If you're just a single simple cell, you're really bad. You want to be in this corner here where you have 100% recall, meaning you detect every edge there is, and 100% precision, meaning when you say, yeah, I see an edge, it really is one. And you want to be there, but this is where the simple cell is. If you wanted to catch 90% of edges, you'd have 20% precision. You'd be constantly saying, yeah, I see an edge, and 80% of the time you're wrong. Um, but this circuit, with these learned boundary cells gives you about a 50% increase in the precision here. And it gives you an even larger, if you wanted to be just to have a really high threshold and only accept the best 50% of edges and throw the rest away, then you're going to get more than a doubling in the precision from this simple circuit. So here's how we think about this visually. Here's that sort of starting point. 
And here's our offset cell that has a different receptive field that sends it a certain amount of learned excitation or a certain learned amount of excitation onto the dendrite of the cell, and then simultaneously sends a certain amount of learned excitation onto the inhibitory. This is a somatostatin neuron, which is in the circuit also. And that basically captures the interaction function between this cell and this cell that helps our target cell do better at boundary detection. Here's another one. Here's another one. I could do this all day. There would be hundreds of them. But anyway, this circuit that you're looking at, which and we know every single kind of connection is here, um, is, is, is helpful for boundary detection. So we only know that because we actually studied boundary detection and said, what do you need to do? And by the way, it's kind of this puzzle. You know, there have been different groups that have looked at spines, neighboring spines and cortical neurons in, in V1, and found that oftentimes on a cell that has a certain orientation tuning, you find inputs that have different orientations kind of scattered all over the dendrites. And people have remarked about this. Arthur Connor had, like, that was like one of the main take homes of their paper 10 years ago or so. And David Fitzpatrick, they found that you have quite a scatter of orientation. And that's what you would expect in a circuit like this that is trying to use all of these neighbors to help do better boundary detection. So, Conclusions um, from this is that, okay, what do, we, what do we hear? So basically, you can do much better about boundary detection, which is so important in V1, if you just use that kind of, uh, these local interactions. And all of them can be positive. None of them can be, ca well, okay, I don't want to say that. I want to say the whole set of interactions can be captured as a family of rising, falling, and then these non-monotonic U-shaped functions. And all of those can be represented by the simple incitation circuit. We call it sort of, you get it, right? Inhibition and excitation glued together. Um, a common cortical circuit motif, which we know is there, OK? And all you need is you need kind of a diversity of firing thresholds in the simple cell population and a single layer learning rule um, to, to set up this circuit. OK, so that's kind of piece number one. Now, here's a different problem, long-range boundary completion. So you're a rhinoceros. Well, you have, you're looking at a rhinoceros. You have contour elements. They tend to align, right? Because contours tend to be continuous. So if you had something there and you saw something there, then you might infer there's something in the middle. That's kind of a nonlinear completion process. You, when, you, when can you infer completion and extension and so on? So what's the interaction there that you want to have? Or what, so it turns out neurophysiologic, neurophysiologically, and this was back 1995, it's ancient history, from Charlie Gilbert's group, um, neurons in V1 and monkeys um, seem to respond to the conjunction of aligned uh, contour elements. So here's the cell whose receptive field here. It likes horizontal things. You put a horizontal bar there, you're going to get 20, 30 spikes per second. You put a horizontal bar outside the receptive field, nothing inside you get nothing, and then if you can join the two together, you get sort of a doubling of the response here by this thing that was itself a silent activator. And that kind of quote unquote multiplicative interaction has been reported, and these are the, the post this time histograms, but and people say, oh yeah, yeah, it has to do with contour detection. But I mean, what exactly should you do with a number that's, or, you know, a, a contrast level here and an oriented contrast level here? What should you do with those two numbers? How should you combine them? I mean, we see something kind of vaguely multiplicative, but what do we really want there? So again, we turned, and then how do you get the multiplicative interaction? So here we alluded to these bio, a biophysical mechanism that we have studied previously. So here you have the cell that would be driven by this input would be delivering excitation, not just anywhere, but biased distally on the dendrites. And the input that would be driving this neighbor over here, this is just another parameter neuron. I'm calling it a modulator because it's sending a horizontal connection over here that's going to modulate this cell's activity, um, contextually modulate the cell's activity, would be biased proximally. This is our hypothesis. Why? Because we have evidence from our earlier studies with Jackie Schiller that this arrangement gives you this asymmetric multiplicative interaction that seems reminiscent, we thought, to the kind of classical contextual interaction that we're seeing in these neurophysiological experiments. But again, we need to study the problem to get a sense of what the, um, what, the uh, what function should the neuron compute. Well, we can turn to natural images again. Um, this was the work of Lei Jin when he was a PhD student. So I'm going to show you two columns here. One is where we collected data from natural images. Uh, and here what we did was we basically grabbed patches of natural images and we measured the oriented contrast here with a little linear filter and then another one here with another filter. Actually, it wasn't linear, but it was a simple filter. And we'd take those two numbers and we would collect them and then depending on the value of these two numbers, we would bin the patch. So these are the ones where both of the numbers are low 
uh, the center, our center and our flanker were both low. There was no oriented contrast there. And then this is the ones where they were both high. And we found that, I mean, obviously, you, when you have both of them high, you're going to tend to have contours running through there. And so we could go through this packet or this pile of images and, and rate contour probability. We had a scoring system. And you're going to find a lot of high probability here and a very low probability there and other probabilities in other places. So we did that. And then we also did, to compare, we did something where we took a range of numbers and we activated proximal synapses and distal synapses in all combinations to see if that proximal distal interaction could capture something about the probability based on a center and a flanker input. And so we collected, we ran biophysical models, we collected action potentials and we counted them and we made surfaces for both of these exercises. And here they are, and, and probably you're not surprised that they're very similar, because otherwise I wouldn't have set up <laughs> this slide in this way. Anyway, this is like based on having humans say, I saw a contour, I didn't see a contour. You can see, basically, if that center contrast goes up, even without any flanker contrast, you know, the probability people start labeling and say, yeah, yeah, I see a contour, goes up slightly or modestly. Over here, the flanker by itself doesn't do much of anything, but in the presence of a strong flanker, you can see this curve is much steeper than this curve, and that's that multiplicative interaction. So it came out of this, this sort of, I want to call it psychophysics, but anyway, human labeling. And, and that's the, this black frame here is the exact same black frame here. This is what you get when you put distal input and proximal input. The proximal input by itself doesn't do much, but it greatly increases the gain to the distal input when it's present. And so what... NMDA channels in this cable. Yeah, okay. And yes. And the high impedance, the reason I put the flanker close is the high impedance looking out. Well, it, it's hard to say in words in, in concisely the reason why, but it's, it's, we have a paper on this that sort of goes through and makes a really simple model that explains why proximal and distal are different from each other in this case. But, but the point is that if you looked at these two ways of generating the data, um, you can't come up with more different ways. I mean, this is you're having humans look at pictures and say, yeah, I see something, I don't, don't see them. And here you have a biophysical model with NMDA channels and cables and all this kind of stuff. And they produce the same surfaces. It tells you that this type of model, a dendrite is natively capable of computing this weird function that you need to compute. And we show that you need to compute it because we collected it from natural images in this way. So we draw this picture by taking those away to make up some space. And then here, let me put this guy over here. And what, what I did was I added a guy who's a little bit farther away, has a receptive field that's kind of outside the reference location, aligned with it, however. And his connection comes over here and makes a connection onto the proximal dendrite, which is what, what we're predicting. You know, can be wrong, can be right. Uh, there's some shreds of evidence that it may be true. And then there's also piling more inhibition, or actually I should say more excitation onto this inhibitory somatostatin neuron, um, to, which basically gives you another parameter to change or you know, to tailor the kind of modulation. And we talk about how flexible the circuit is for generating modulatory interactions through these horizontal connections. So that's that function piled on top of the previous function. And we conclude that this long range contextual thing can, be, can benefit from nonlinear spatial integration mechanisms in dendrites. The previous thing did not depend on that. OK. Problem three, this is very quick because it had nothing to do with us. This is noticing this fascinating thing that it, there are cells in V1. I, this kind of, you know, you think of cells, V1 being sort of cells that look for orientation tuned things like simple Gabor functions. So this is from um, Shiming Tang's group in 2018. They found that cells, a large proportion of cells in V1 with calcium imaging in monkeys liked and insisted on very, you know, on, on more complex patterns that had at least two orientations involved. And so they used all these different kinds of patterns. And here, for example, you have one that likes, that kind of insists on having this curve. And if you don't, and, and if you do kind of anything different other than a very similar curve, then you, you get much lower responses. You can see here's a piece of the curve. Here they kind of you know, I don't know, you could look at all these different variations, and the cell's very picky. Also is picky about location, but it requires multiple orientations that are kind of in a conjunction. Here, this cell requires, literally requires a curve. Uh, well, it requires a curve, and it also likes, it's pretty specific to the location. So we have higher order features being computed already in V1 and the monkey, too. Now, our, in our picture, the way that we add this is just to sort of state a biophysical fact that if we had a couple of cells over here that each encoded some oriented feature, and they were both, you know, and this, this created some kind of a shape, like a, 
a pointy corner that if both of these cells are active together and their synapses were kind of co-localized or intermingled on the dendrites, this is exactly the kind of configuration where you get very good nonlinear interactions and you get NMDA channels activated and you can make a little conjunction detector and AND an AND gate, sort of, because you have NMDA channels if you can co-localize synapses. It is now established that, that synapses that fire together can, can wire together at the, you know, at the very fine scale of the dendrites. And also I want to point out that even back in the 1980s, Gordon Shepard and others were saying that you could get AND-like interactions. They didn't know about NMDA channels, but they knew about sodium channels, and they were already talking about this kind of thing. So we're just basically throwing it onto our picture to say that that other function of E1 conjunction is easily computable within the dendrites of the cells uh, that are there. And that's just what I said, and I don't want to repeat it. So I want to add this, this one more problem, which is very interesting, which is uh, how do you do Q combination? OK, so uh, here, let me just draw this. There are cells in V1 that combine Qs, like luminance and color. These are called color luminance cells. Um, Elizabeth Johnson is one of the people who's done a lot of work on this. And, and so somehow these, these inputs, think of them as like little driver simple cells or something, are piling their, their outputs onto this one cell that has to then be sensitive to both color and luminance with the same orientation. But, but again, how should these two inputs be combined? Should you put these on one dendrite and these on another? Should you add them? Should you multiply them? Should you square root them and multiply by seven? I mean, wh what do you do? So we again, we turn to our, our go-to approach, um, which is we uh, how to combine boundary keys. We decided to study the boundary problem with, with image label. And this was, this was the work with Francis Mel de Fontenay. OK, how should a neuron combine them? So what we did, here's a. Here's an intensity channel seeing the world, and you can see that it sees, it's good down here. You get these good sharp intensity edges here, but you don't get so much intensity edge here. But here you get a lot of good red-green here, but not so much. It's like very complementary where the red-green channel is seeing the horse and where the intensity channel is seeing the horse. So we said, but if you got these two measurements, what should you do with them? Again, should you add them? Should you add them and apply a threshold? Should you multiply them? If you had cells that were responsive individually to these things. So we, we labeled a whole bunch of image patches and we, with human, and we assigned values to the contours and we used that to train. So what is the function? We trained a conventional network with three layers with backpropagation to see what the combination function looked like. And here's what it looked like. It's a, some interesting nonlinear function. As the red-green intensity goes up, you get more value. And the intensity goes up, you get more value. You have this interesting nonlinear interaction there uh, from the data. And we, you know, if you apply that, then you get a nice complementary kind of image where you get sort of it's strong anywhere that this one was strong or this one was strong. It's, and, and, and it, did, it did what it did. It did what, it, with what the natural images told it to do. But we weren't really that interested in backpropagation and an arbitrary network. So what we said was that there's a trick that if you want to learn nonlinear functions, but you don't have backpropagation, you only can sort of train one layer of weights. There's a trick that's been known since, I, the first I remember this is from Marr and Albus's models of the cerebellum from like 1970, where they proposed that the granule cell layer was basically created a whole bunch of nonlinear basis functions. Actually, you talked about this too. Uh, 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 ab, uh, yeah, Abby, um, in, in your talk about having a bunch of nonlinear basis functions makes it really easy to learn the things you need to learn. So we saying, well, look, there's got to be some basis functions. The dendrites might be able to provide a set of nonlinear basis functions sort of spanning some space that makes it really easy to learn a function. So we, we developed that and we, we trained this one layer of weights and found that we can exactly, I mean, pretty much exactly imitate what a multi-layered network could learn um, with, with a single layer of weights. Now, here's where the basis functions come. I think this is the coolest thing that I'm going to tell you today. So where do you get nonlinear basis functions coming from a bunch of dendrites? So there's this very little known feature. Here's a pyramidal neuron. This is from uh, De Felipe et al., in, uh, an anatomical paper. There are double bouquet cells in monkeys and humans in V1, not in rodents. So this is a very highly evolved feature. Have these very narrow inhibitory bu axonal bundles. You can see this one here coming down here. It's like 10 microns in diameter. And you can see this kind of streaky pattern is those bundles just coursing down through the visual cortex. And this is a top view. You can see they're on like a 30 micron pitch here on the, you know, kind of irregular but spaced out like that. Now, why would you have that thing? I mean, I've never heard of anybody even notice, knowing it was there. I mean, I don't know how many people read this paper. This is a fantastic paper. But why would you have it? So um, here's how we think about it. The dendrites of these cells are sort of sticking out into this lattice. 
and they're going to be hit with inhibition. You know, when the, when the dendrite kind of happens to go through a bunch of these, you're going to get a lot of inhibition at several different locations. This one here goes out, it misses the inhibition, and then sort of catches a little bit on the tip. This one here might catch a little bit in the middle of the dendrite and then doesn't catch any on the way out further. So basically, it creates this inhibition pattern, which is kind of randomly peppering the dendrites. Now, we happen to know from previous biophysical work, and this was also, these were experimental studies, that depending on if you've got a bunch of in, in excitation on a dendrite, depending on where you would place inhibition, um, you get a, it, it modifies both the gain and the threshold of that dendrite's input-output function and creates like a little different nonlinear basis function <laughs> of you know, whatever is coming into that dendrite. And so what we, you know, you have proximal inputs tend to knock down the gain, just like proximal excitation tends to boost the gain. I showed you that earlier. And distal inhibition tends to increase the threshold without changing the gain. So you have this kind of combination of gain and threshold changes. And we think that, that, that these I'm drawing here, these kind of double bouquet axonal bundles, kind of hitting the dendrites all at random different locations, is essentially creating a whole bunch of diverse nonlinear subunits that putting synaptic plasticity on top of allows that one layer of weights to represent nonlinear functions. Okay, so we think that's, uh, that's maybe what's going on. We, I, mean, I don't know, you might have another idea what these double bouquet cells are for. Okay, I think I'm pretty much done. I, threw, I clicked the button and I threw some other things up in here just to kind of confuse you. We haven't done any work up there. I, I just writing down what other people have kind of told us that we have excitation here. We have its own little sort of incitation network. And, and I kind of wanted to uh, overwhelm you with, with the picture. Um, now, it's, it's a slightly multi-headed beast because we have slapped everything that we know kind of onto one neuron, whereas this, these multiple functions might be cascaded even within V1. We know that all of these things happen in V1 somewhere, somehow. But it's, it's uh, it, you know, anyway, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's valuable to compare to the interaction between cells in a conventional neural network where you have a precursor cell, sends a connection through a weight to another cell, all you can have is a weighted connection, and then this cell, all it can do is add up a bunch of weighted inputs, so it's a linear combination rule. This is incredibly simple compared to the cell-cell interactions, immediate cell-cell interactions, direct monosynaptic interactions, which are much more intricate and flexible, and we think that picking apart those kind of biases in the cortical circuits and then doing this kind of uh, normative analysis with, by picking problems and studying them is a very good way to help decipher this whole thing. And so I, that's my last slide, and I, I put the title up here because the title actually apply, kind of applies pretty well to this picture. Um, and I, I want to leave this, kind of imprint this on your mind and kind of think about this type of a network in, in comparison to the interconnection schemes and conventional artificial networks that people use every day for, uh, for doing brain-like computation. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, so now we have uh, about five minutes for some questions. Uh, maybe I, I would like to start. Um, so on the second part of, of your talk, uh, you showed that you could train uh, one neuron uh, to have a type of uh, uh, response profile that resembles uh, human um, behavior in identifying you know, those, those contours. Um, is there any reason to expect that to have single neuron in V1 that would precisely align uh, with um, you know, contour integration at that level? Uh, is, there, is it being described? Or, or would we expect this something to be you know, something downstream of V1? Well, the, the reason that you would expect it is based on this normative assumption that we know the importance of contour detection and contour representation for object recognition. Um, we know that. The psychophysicists have told us that. Okay, so that has to be computed along the visual pathway. So we just kind of assumed, let's say a neuron has to do that and it has these cues available. We can then, now those are clearly stated assumptions. We can then go to natural images, figure out, okay, if our assumptions were true, then this is the function that that neuron would need to compute on those inputs. And that's all we did. And then we said, oh, the function that it computes, we think that the cortex would allow it to compute it because it has this hardware component and this interaction and this dendrite and this channel, blah, blah, blah. So we kind of, tried to connect what we, the, 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 our normative assumption and our analysis of natural images told the cell should try to compute based on its inputs 
And then we kind of explored different hardware solutions for doing it. And then that's kind of what this picture contains, is like a, a compendium of every hardware solution that we, that we came up with. Um, I understand the, the, the normative uh, uh, inspiration behind it. My question is more like, is there any reason to expect that a single neuron would match? Well, because the, the same type of uh, uh, you know, match could be at a, a population of neurons. Is there, or, or maybe not a reason, but is there any advantage for this being? Uh, well, yes, because if you're trying to build shape representation, knowing that there's a boundary to a certain location and a certain orientation is valuable, period. Um, if you tried to construct a, an object recognition system, you would want to know that. Again, I'm making a normative assumption, so I'll, I'll keep doing that all day long. Um, but I don't, I don't know how to answer your question better than saying that. And I, but I can also say that neurophysiologists have not tested cells in V1 for boundary detection capabilities. They'll put a grating there and say, oh, it likes this grating. But that's very different from detecting it, uh, oriented contours in natural images. So that has not been tested. So we've actually got in, in our preprint an experiment that would distinguish between a cell that just an orientation to cell and likes gratings from one that really likes boundaries and doesn't like non-boundaries. And, and so, but those experiments haven't been done yet. Thank you. Hila? Robert? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very nice. Um, so. So uh, several, at least several years ago, um, in computer vision, people think that uh, convolutional neural networks are not very uh, good at seeing shapes, that they see texture better, and that's how they do a lot of the object classification. And you have shown us that it's definitely non-trivial to do the contour detection right. So do you think that um, that's part of the reason that these convolutional network, because they're missing some foundation like fundamental com computational properties of the dendrites here, that they tend to focus more on the texture rather than the contours. Yes, I would just answer the question more generally. The answer is yes, I believe what you just said. But I would say just generally, conventional networks have no biases in them, essentially. They're just stacks of identical units. OK, you throw in a normalization. You throw in a pooling layer. But basically, these are generic units in generic kind of stacks with weights in between them. They, have, they lack any of the representational biases that you're going to find. I mean, look at, I mean, we know this stuff is there. I mean, we know these neurons have this stuff there. It, it's just a, this isn't what evolution gives you. It's a huge mess. It's hard to figure out. It's complicated. You don't know exactly how it works. But it's incredibly biased towards these computations. How could we do incredibly good visual processing in visual cortex and incredibly good sound processing in the other areas of cortex? You'd have a picture like this, only it would be a little different, you know? And so, yeah, the con conventional networks just have not, they've gone with, you know, using backprop and, and gradient descent over 50 layers to try to solve the, you know, to try to do evolution. It's not a good way to do evolution. You're not gonna design a cat by doing backprop, you know, uh, or uh, versus a dolphin. You know, this, I'm, I'm revealing my biases here. Uh, you know, you need to actually study the thing and optimize it for that thing. I mean, that's what evolution seems to do. So I'm kind of into that. So what do you, could you show us that there's some improvement between when you take nonlinearities and a single uh, cell So what do you think is, is limiting the performance? Uh, what are the sort of limitations that you see that will get us to the point where we can really recognize boundaries at the human level? Are you asking sort of what stages would follow these simple computations here in order to do like recognition of objects? Right. Right. Well, I mean, that's, that's a big question, and we have to sit down and talk about that one. Uh, we, we think about that a lot, and we're working very hard on that, but I can't, that's not something that's open to, or, or amenable to a concise answer. <laughs> You're saying basically how to solve the rest of the brain, you know, it, or the rest of the visual system, and that's, you know. Bartlett, so relative to, you know, conventional uh, artificial neural networks, um, I'm trying to understand the bias that you're describing over here, right? So there's a bias which is, I mean, we can think about each cell as doing um, multiple nonlinear computations, which you could imagine outsourcing to um, a network level computation. One difference here um, that I guess is a form of inductive bias is that each of these nonlinear units is not receiving an independent error signal, right? Like when you're using the delta rule, you're giving one single error signal to the whole un to the whole neuron. Yes. But each neuron consists of these multiple nonlinearities. So that's a, that's fundamentally what's different here, right? Because when you do backpropagation in a conventional artificial network, then each unit gets an error signal. Well, there are multiple. 
I know I would not say, it's, it's, I'd say that's a piece of this, but I'm saying there are multiple things that are kind of, I would call biases, I mean, in a general way. First of all, the components, certain components do things that are very difficult, are very difficult to do compactly in a you know, with conventional units. For example, this proximal distal bias, which has kind of a multi-dimensional sigmoidal input-output behavior. If that's what you need, you need, it's much more compact to just use the dendrite to do it than to construct or hope that, that, that the gradient descent will find just the right circuit for you, uh, you know, from 50 layers up, you know. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The connectional biases in the cortex are very strong. You don't sort of have really simple connectivity diagrams like these long range connections are known to travel over millimeters and they'll target the guys of the same orientation. So there's these very powerful anatomical biases and you have, you know, so there, you can kind of go down the list of, of different things where the, the architecture is clearly designed to do something specific. And, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a kind of a, this feeling in the field of the deep, sort of the deep networks field, and this was propounded by Google and other people, don't study the problem. Don't figure it out. That's too hard. It takes too many engineers. Just put the network in there and hit it with gazillion training examples and let gradient descent do the work for you. And I, I just think, I mean, you know, obviously deep networks have done incredible things, but they have not done an incredibly good job of building, you know, like circuits that actually do vision as well as we do. They build brittle systems. They fail in just catastrophic ways and weird ways. And so we, we need to put a little more energy into figuring out what the problems are and what the optimizations are. Thank you. And I think that concludes the Q&A. So let's thank uh, Dr. Martin again. Yes.